Our church's theme for the year is blessed to be a blessing. Our blessed to be a blessing. We desire to be blessed. We desire to be blessed. We desire that God will bless us. Why? Of course, because it's lovely to be blessed. It's really enjoyable to live in that blessing of the Lord. But so much more than just wanting, wanting the blessing. We want the blessing so that we can pass it on as well. Our desire is that God will bless us so much that it will just flow over and touch and reach everyone around us. Um, Our desire is to be used by God. In my family, in my workplace, at my school, at King's Kids Week. So that after people spend time with me, so when people have spent time in my presence, they must walk away loving God more. After they experience my relationship with God and the way I speak and the way I do, that they will love God more. Have you ever experienced that when God used you like that? Where you realize, this is not me. God is busy pouring His blessings through me to other people's lives. And you walk away and you really understand that verse that says, you know, it's better to give than to receive. There's so much more joy in being able to bless others than just receiving the blessings. Now, the problem might arise. That you look around and you say, you know what? I can totally agree that God can use that person or that person. I mean, look at them. They're very outgoing or they are very rich or they are very beautiful or they are able to speak to a crowd or they are so intelligent. But me, just look at me. I can't even speak to people. And when I do, they look at me very weirdly. Look at the family I come from. Look at how I look. Look at all my issues, my anger, my anxiety, my ill health. God can't use me. Perhaps that's how you are feeling before King's Kids Week. And you say, you know what, I've I've met all these people on Friday. And man, some of them look like they really, they know this God guy. I am still so new in all of this. I'm sure God is going to use them, but I'll I'll just sit in the background and see what's going on. Perhaps that's how you feel when you deal with your unbelieving family or the people at work. And you're saying, can't the pastor just come visit me a bit more so that he can tell these people, I'm just, not me, God can't use me to reach my family. An amazing thing you see when you really start diving deep into God's word is that God often, if not always, chooses people to use mightily that the world would not have chosen. If you look at the people that God says, come now, follow me, let's go do something great. It's not the people that the world would have chosen. When David, when Samuel went to go anoint David, his father sent all the fancy, big, strong sons. And Samuel, uh-uh, not that one, not that one, not that one. And they're like, don't you have any other sons? Yeah, but the useless one. Um, bring him. And God says, that one. So if you're sitting here today and you're feeling like, not me. I have issues. God can't use me. Then you need to remember. Noah was a drunk. Abram was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremy and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. (laughs) And if you read God's word, what he did through these people, God loved them and he used them mightily. Let's look a bit today at one of those guys on the list that I mentioned, and and that's the guy Gideon. You can open your Bibles to Judges 6. Judges is Richters in Afrikaans. That's the sixth book in the Old Testament. Richter says, Judges 6, we're going to read from verse 11 to 16. Judges 6. I'm going to ask you to keep your Bible open because we read as we discuss it and we look at other verses. So please keep your Bible open and... But before we read Judges 6 together, let's just pray. God, thank you that we can have your words in our hands. Your message to us. Lord, we decide how often you speak to us. By how often we pick up our Bibles. So Lord, that is our desire today, that you will speak to us. 
not just in a dead book and dead words, Lord, but that we will reach through this word, through this book, and make a connection with you. That it will be you saying these things to us. Speak into our hearts, Lord. I know there are hard hearts here today. I want you to bash them open. Lord, I know there are broken hearts here. I want you to tenderly heal them. Lord, and I know there are hearts here that are just so far away from you, and I just want to pray that you will pull them back. Thank you that you are all those things and that you are exactly what we need. Speak to us today, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We read it from verse 11, and it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth, or the oak tree, at Ophrah, which belongs to Joash the Abazrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Now this is a very strange picture we have here. We have this guy called Gideon, and he's busy threshing wheat. I don't know if you, I'm not a farmer, but I've learned that what you do is you have like a, a thing, an implement, and you throw the things in the air, the wheat and the chaff in the air. And the idea is that the wind will take away all the chaff, and then it's the wheat that fell down again. And you'll carry on doing this into the wind until all the chaff is blown away, and you're just left with the wheat. Now, where should you be doing this? You should be doing this on a threshing floor. There's a picture we have there. So you see there in the middle, there's all the wheat in the trough, and there's that implement whose name I forgot. And then you have a lot of space around you because you don't want anything to mess up. You throw it in the air, the trough, wind takes all the trough away, and the wheat falls down again. That's where Gideon should have been. But where is Gideon? He's inside a wine press. Now we have some pictures of a wine press here. It's a hollowed out area in the ground. And it's often very small, because obviously you want to collect the wine. And some people say this would have been actually more what Gideon would have been using. It's just a very deep hole in the ground. You can see there's a ladder in there that you climb to the bottom and you step on the grapes and you, th- and you wine press them inside there. Imagine threshing wheat in there. There's no space, firstly. There's no wind. It's a futile exercise. But why was he doing this? Because we read earlier in the chapter that the Midianites invaded Israel. They took control. And the Israelites would work very hard on their farms to get everything ready. And when everything was just perfectly ready, the Midianites came and they said like a bunch of locusts. And they just came and they took everything. And then they'll start again. Okay, let's just plan. Hopefully next time, if we plan, next time we can get a bit. And they're just ready, do all the hard work, just ready for the next harvest. And the Midianites again come like a bunch of locusts and they just take everything. So Gideon managed to keep some of that wheat for himself. And now he needs to separate it from the trough. So he's standing there in the the wine press doing his best, but I think he's struggling. And what's happening here? The angel of the Lord arrives. And we've seen that many people believe, me included, that when you read in the Old Testament about the angel of the Lord, Then it refers to Jesus before he was born later in the New Testament. So this is the image of Jesus as he appears on earth, the angel of the Lord. When I say an angel of the Lord or angels of the Lord, those are normal angels. But when it becomes specific, the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus visiting Gideon. And I love this image. He's sitting there under a tree looking at Gideon. (laughs) What are you doing? What do you think you're achieving down there? Um, You know what? I think sometimes this often happens to me. I'm here trying to do things in my own power and I'm working in lack of faith or working in fear and I'm doing things my way. And God is standing there looking, what are you doing? You are being so ineffective because you're trying to do things in your strength and in your wisdom. And God just looks at me and shakes his head. So the angel of the Lord then makes himself visible to Gideon. We read in verse 12 where he says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. I think Gideon must have gone, Is there someone behind me? It can't be me. I'm hiding away here in the wine press. How can you say this? And then he started mulling over these words. The Lord is with me? The Lord is with me? How can he say that? And we read there in verse 13. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? 
But now the Lord has forsaken us and given, given us into the hand of Midian. You can see there's not only fear in Gideon, there's bitterness as well. Now we've heard the stories. God is supposedly great. He supposedly took all these people out of Egypt and he walked every day with them and he gave them food to eat and he gave them water from the rock to drink. But where is he now? Ha! Huh. You say the Lord is with me. Where is he now? And maybe you feel like that today. He's saying, ah, oh, I hear what people say about God. And people come stand in front in church and they give testimonies about how wonderful he is. That's not my experience. Where is this God? Where is this God that all of you are talking about? And the thing is, the chapter already told us why they are where they are. If you look a bit up in Judges 6, verse 8 to 10, the, God spoke to them through a prophet and he says, verse 8, 6, verse 8, The Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Gideon is very bitter. It's your fault, God. Look at what's going on around us. All your fault. You're the one that's supposed to be here. God already told them through a prophet, I am all those things, but you chose not to obey my voice. You were the ones who turned your back on me. I wasn't the one who turned my back on you. But the thing is, when Gideon speaks to the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord doesn't answer his question. He didn't say again, yeah, you know, all this terrible thing is your fault. It's almost as if the Lord is more interested in what could be than in what is. He's not coming to you to speak about all the terrible things you've done and all those type of things. He's saying, let's talk about what could be. Let's talk about what can happen. And we read there in Judges 6 verse 14. And the Lord, another reminder that this is not just an angel. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. Go in the might of yours. Now, it's almost like Gideon looks at this original saying, and he's saying, you know, I have a problem with the first part, that the Lord is with you, but I have a problem with that second part as well. O mighty man of valor, that's mean like the mighty warrior, the, the leader that takes people into battle. And now you say I have to go in my own strength. And we read there in Judges 6 verse 15, and Gideon, he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He's saying, let's look at how things are. Here's Manasseh, not even the best tribe in Israel. Let's go into Manasseh and we find the weakest, smallest clan. Ah, I'm there. Let's go to a family there. Oh, yeah, I'm there. Let's look at the weakest person in that family. Oh, there I am. Now you call me mighty man of valor. You see, the mistake Gideon made was, he looked at the problem and he looked at himself and he said, uh-uh, <laughs> this is not going to happen. This is can't fix that. And he is right. In his own strength, he cannot do that. He is right. In our own strength, we cannot do that. He is right. In our own strength, we cannot do King's Kids Week. In our own strength, we cannot love our kids. They are often lovable, but we can't love them like we should. In our own strength, we can't love our neighbors like we should. In our own strength, we can't tell people about God like we should. But that is not what the angel calls him to. Because then we read in verse 16, Judges 6 verse 16, And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. He's saying, I am sending you. And I'm not just sending you, I'm going with you when I send you. The strength that you have is not you. The strength you have is me going with you. The strength you have is not relying on me when you go out, but looking next to you saying, God is here with me. He'll do it. Well, we're not, having, we're not going to have time for the rest of the passage. So that's homework. You're going to have to go read that at home. And read the rest of the chapter and see how God used Gideon 
mightily to defeat this Midianite army that came every year, took on all the Israelites and just walked over them like locusts. And Gideon defeated them without ever picking up a sword. Without ever picking up a sword. I don't want to give away too much of the story, but nobody attacks a mighty army with a trumpet in the one hand and a torch in the other hand and saying, what a mighty warrior I am. Look how I killed everyone. You walk away with a trumpet and a torch. You're saying, what happened? It wasn't me. God used me. All I did was listen and I obeyed and God used me. And they didn't kill a single Midianite. The Midianite killed himself and they ran like locusts away. I don't think locusts can run. They ran away. So what do we do? What do we learn from this? We learn that the trouble we face is big and scary. You and I share some troubles. There are certain things that we all of us look to the future and say, oh no. But each of us also have our own troubles. And maybe just thinking about your troubles make you also want to go hide in a wine press. Also just dig a hole and say, goodness me, let me just get away from you. And with presenting King's Kids Week, we start a war with Satan and his armies. That's what King's Kids Week is. We're starting a war with Satan and his armies because we desire to take people out of the kingdom of, of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light. That's what it means to tell people about Jesus. That's what it means to ask people to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You are part of the world. You are not a child of God. Come into the kingdom. Do you think Satan is going to love that? This time of the year, the Rishmala's home is not a good place to be. Everything breaks. Because Satan doesn't like what we do. So the, the trouble we face is big. And I don't know always what trouble you face. Whether it's trouble in yourself. Trouble with things that are just so broken inside of you and you just don't know what to do with it. Trouble in your family. Trouble in broken families and parents against parents and parents against children. And maybe your trouble is just what's going on in South Africa or what's going on in the world. The trouble we face is big, but the next thing is that we cannot do what we need to do in our own strength. When we look at the problem and we look at ourselves, we should get scared. If that's all we get to look to. But we also get to look up. We don't just look at the problem and we don't just look at ourselves. We look up at the God that says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. God is with us. And in his strength, amazing things can happen. So what must we do? Just listen and obey. Just listen and obey. Don't expect to do the wonderful things. Just listen and obey. The nights, a couple of nights before King's Kids Week, I'm all flustered and anxious about this and, and thinking about that. And, and that's just a reminder of me that I can't do this for myself. We can't do what we set out to do in God's um, strength in ourselves. We cannot. We cannot. But the good news is the Lord is with you. O mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. So in conclusion, how are you doing? How are you doing today, O mighty man of valor? Are you ready for the battle, mighty woman of valor? I told the King's Kids Week team on Friday that their role this week is to lead children to Christ in word and in deed. That's what we do. We lead children to Christ in what we tell them, when we bring God's word to them, bring the gospel, the good news to them, and also indeed how we live before them, how we live every day. And we cannot do it. We cannot live like we should and speak like we should. But in, in His strength, we can. In our own strength, we can tell fun stories and play fun games and sing cool songs and walk away from the week saying, what a fun, great week. And nothing would have changed. But if we go and we realize the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor, mighty things can happen. God can save. Someone shared this week that someone came to visit them whose dad got saved 60 years ago in a program like this. And it changed the whole family. It set that whole family up for the kingdom to follow God's kingdom. Um, in our own we can't. But in His strength we can. The Lord is with you, 
O mighty man of valor, are you ready to face the battle? Yes, Lord, we do. And I thank you for every single prayer that's gone up, even those from the mouths of babies, Lord. Thank you that your, your ear is listening and your hand is ready to help. Thank you that we're not going out in our own strength, Lord. And I know some of the team are very scared for what's happening tomorrow, Lord. And, and we should be scared when we look at ourselves and look at the problem. And that, that's a good place to start because then we start relying on you. But Lord, help us to move beyond that fear. And to rely on you and to work in your power and your strength. And not fear what's facing us because we know the Lord is with us. We are mighty men and women of valor. So Lord, we pray that you will work mightily in this week. I pray for every single person in this team and those who can't be here this morning, that you, you will meet with them as well. That they will also be able to listen, hear your voice, and to obey. Lord, we pray for every child. Lord, we pray for the children and the team not to get sick, Lord. We pray for no issues of, of, of accidents or anything like that, Lord, so that nothing will distract from children bringing glory to you and hearing about your good news. So Lord, we pray for everyone, everyone involved on whatever level. Thank you that you're bringing us all together in service for you so that we can be a blessing. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.